Hello everyone, it's Rosanna Berardi, the Managing Partner at Berardi Immigration Law. Thank you for joining me today for our Privacy Rights at the Border, Safeguarding Your Business and Personal Information on Your Electronic Devices. It's noon, I'm just waiting for a few others to um, join us and we'll get going. Okay, so let's get started. It's 12.02. Thank you for registering for our webinar today where we're talking about keeping your cell phone and its information safe at the U.S. border crossings. This webinar will be available. Uh, we're recording it, so after the session, if you are interested in sharing this with your coworkers, your friends, your family, just let us know, and we are happy to provide you with a copy of it. So again, this is Rosanna Berardi, Managing Partner of Berardi Immigration Law. We're a business immigration firm located in Buffalo, New York. We help individuals and corporations enter the U.S. for both work and personal reasons. There's a lot going on at the border these days. So I, I thought it would be a good place to start to always look at the U.S. Constitution. What does the U.S. Constitution say about the right to privacy? Well, the Fourth Amendment, one of the most popular amendments of the Constitution, says, basically, that the government cannot search or seize your property, your home, your papers, any of your effects, without probable cause. Probable cause is a technical term that means that they must have some reasoning to be able to search your laptop, your purse, to come into your home, um, they must have probable cause to do that. So that's where we're starting today. The U.S. Constitution provides a right to privacy under the Fourth Amendment. So how does the Fourth Amendment work at the border? Well, it's complicated because while the border is not a constitutional free zone, um, the Fourth Amendment is greatly relaxed at a U.S. border crossing so that Customs and Border Protection, the folks that are in charge with keeping our borders safe, are able to act in the interest of national security. So it's carefully balanced, the Fourth Amendment's carefully balanced against U.S. constitutional protections, but also at the same time, the United States' interest in self-preservation and national security. So what does this mean for you as a traveler? Well, first of all, let's talk about the folks in charge. Customs and Border Protection are the gatekeepers at the border. They're the folks that you talk to when you're entering the United States. They'll ask for your citizenship. Where are you going? Do you have anything to declare? Their job is to keep our border safe. They're looking for criminal issues, drug possession, counterfeit goods. They're looking for people that have warrants out for their arrest. They're looking for contraband. So it is their duty, and they were created as the result of the September 11th terrorist attack um, under the Department of Homeland Security. Their, their sole duty is to keep America safe and our borders safe. So what happens if the government wants to search your iPhone or your Android phone when you're crossing the border? Well, know that there is a border search exception that says, okay, we know we've got the Fourth Amendment in the U.S. Constitution, but 
we are going to allow Customs and Border Protection to search your vehicle, your cell phones, any of your personal effects without probable cause, meaning for any reason they can look at anything that you're carrying while crossing the border. They have the right to search you, your vehicle, your luggage, and your cell phone without a warrant and without any suspicion of wrongdoing. And please know that every single person that crosses the U.S. border is subject to a search. So don't think because you're a U.S. citizen that this doesn't apply to you. This certainly applies. So let's look at where we've been and compare that to where we are today. So under the Obama administration, the Obama administration still acknowledged the long-standing principles of the border search exception. Federal agents were allowed to search travelers, persons, and belongings without a warrant. This really has been a long-standing policy for decades and decades um, under the, the federal government. So under President Obama, they acknowledged the border exception, exception provision and people and their effects were routinely searched. So how is that different under the Trump administration? Well, the Trump administration issued a new directive on the search of electronic devices on January 4th of 2018. And while most of the directive mirrors what occurred under the Obama administration, there's an entirely separate section that deals with electronic searches. So we have this new directive. It's been in place for about three months, supersedes anything that was done under the Obama administration, as well as last year, 2017, which was President Trump's first year in office. So let's talk numbers. When you listen to the, the general media, people will say to me all the time, oh boy, the number of searches are you know increasing, skyrocketing. Everyone's being searched. Their stuff is being seized. What's going on at the border? Well, let's look at the numbers. So Customs and Border Protection provided us with data last year that said in 2017, they processed almost 400 million international travelers to the United States. On any given day, they're talking to about a million people a day. It's a lot of people. Let's look back in fiscal year 2016. Of those, you know, roughly 400 million, they searched about 19,000 people. And for 2017, to compare apples to apples, of the 400 million international travelers in 2017, they searched about 30,000 individuals. So when you look at that statistically, it's 0.007% of international travelers, which is a really small number. So you may be asking yourself right now, well, why are we listening to this webinar if the number is so small? Well, it's really important for you to know as a business individual or a frequent traveler to the U.S., if you are selected for a search, you need to know how to protect your cell phone that's in your pocket or in your purse. So let's look at this new directive issued by the Trump administration in January of this year. You know, as, as we all know, everyone carries a, a smartphone these days, and that smartphone has so much information on it. It has business information, confidential emails, photos, social media accounts. It has our calendar. It could have passwords. The amount of information we carry in our pockets every day is unprecedented. You know, 25 years ago when you crossed the border, you crossed with your wallet and maybe your checkbook in your purse. Contrast that with today, where you could be traveling with upwards of 2,000 photos, um, five different social media handles, your work email, your personal email, your banking information, um, an app that shows every place that you've been, GPS tracking. So you're coming to the border in a vastly different position today than you would have even 10 years ago. So under this new directive, the government says, with respect to electronic devices, the government's allowed to, to carry out two types of searches, a basic search and an advanced search. So what do those terms mean? The basic search is the government and their ability to look at anything on your cell phone. They can ask for your password um, and they can look at anything, they can review, they can analyze information on your device. So let's say we're sitting in Buffalo, New York today, you're a Canadian citizen, you're coming to the U.S. for a business meeting, 
you have your work phone and your personal cell phone on you. You're coming into the United States. You're talking to Customs and Border Protection. They're not really convinced about where, where, what your intent is for the U.S. They're not sure where you're going, what you're going to be doing. So they say, Mr. Smith, can I please look at your phone? At that point, you're required to turn your phone over along with any password protections so the government can scan your emails. They can look through it. They can look at pictures. They can look at your calendar. Now, if they suspect something with respect to criminality, drug trafficking, anything that they think is uh, conflicting with the U.S. national security and well-being of the United States, they are authorized to do an advanced search. That's when they can not only look at your information, but they can connect it and download it. Um, they can review it, they can copy it, and analyze your content. So they can actually make a copy of the data on your cell phone. Two of these um, advanced searches were recently in the news in widely publicized incidents um, regarding a pair of individuals related to the Trump administration. So in January of 2018, George Nader, who is a Middle Eastern specialist with ties to President Trump, upon entering the U.S. at Dulles International Airport, he was on an overseas trip. He learned upon arrival that Special Counsel Robert Mueller was interested in speaking to him about his involvement with key meetings between the United Arab Emirates and President Trump's associates. So the FBI, in this case, they obtained a search warrant. They searched and they seized his cell phone and they imaged all of the electronic data. He was subsequently served with a grand jury subpoena. And then similarly, just last month, a gentleman by the name of Ted Malak, a political consultant connected with President Trump's election campaign, he was detained by Customs and Border Protection and the FBI upon arrival to Logan Airport in Boston upon his return um, from London, England. And there, his cell phone was also confiscated, copied, and was advised that it would be analyzed for a full assessment. So this stuff is happening day in, day out. These are really high profile cases that have been newsworthy in the last couple months, but it's definitely occurring at the border. So what happens if you say to Customs and Border Protection, sorry, I'm not giving you my password? Well, you can't really say that. It doesn't matter if you're Canadian, US citizen, Spanish citizen, Italian citizen, you're required to unlock that passport that, I'm sorry, the password on your devices and decrypt the data for any officer asking to do so. What happens if you say, nope, not doing that? Well, the government's going to take your phone and then they're going to seek technical assistance to unlock that phone and they can actually seize the phone. And we've heard a few stories um, from some of our cross-border friends that if your phone has been seized, it can take several months to get it back from the government. So we certainly do not advise that you try to assert um, any type of rights at the border regarding giving up your password. So under this directive, what about info stored on a cloud service? So Apple has the iCloud platform, meaning that all of your data is backed up electronically somewhere. The good news um, is that Customs and Border Protection, the officers are not allowed to search information that's stored on a cloud service. So one way of safeguarding your information is to have everything backed up on a cloud service. So what happens if you're traveling with privileged information? Think about if you're a lawyer, a doctor, if you're a business person that has proprietary information or trade secrets on your cell phone. What happens if the government says, give me your phone, I want to take a look at it? Well, I can tell you as a lawyer, I have an ethical duty under the New York State ethics rules and also the federal ethics rules to protect any confidential information under the attorney-client privilege. So if I'm a lawyer and Customs and Border Protection says, Mrs. Berardi, let me see your phone. And I say, sorry, officer, I have emails um, you know, between myself, my law firm, and our clients, and under the attorney-client privilege, I'm not allowed to give you this um, phone, you will have to tell the officer a couple things. You'll have to tell the officer, you know, which of your emails are client-related. 
Um, you can give them the name of the file, the name of the client, email addresses, phone numbers. Um, you must also tell the officer that you are, you know, tr you are trying to protect privilege information. So as a lawyer, for example, I would point to the attorney-client privilege. And at that point, Customs and Border Protection is supposed to only look at the non-privileged information, which sounds great. But in my mind, this guidance is like splitting hairs because the government, in the name of national security and protecting the United States, can quickly say, well, we understand this is privileged information, but in the interest of national security, we're going to have to look at this document or this email that's on your cell phone. So what do you do? Basically, at the end of the day, the government can make an argument all day long that there's something that they want to see um, and they're going to look at it because of it. And, and they can always point to their national security interest as trumping, no pun intended, any type of stated privilege. So keep that in mind. So what do you do? A couple takeaways from our webinar today. How do you protect your sensitive data, whether it's a trade secret, whether it's proprietary software, proprietary information, information under the HIPAA rules, information under attorney-client. How do you protect that when you're traveling internationally? Best thing to do is to save that privileged or sensitive data on a cloud service. I know that it's a lot of preparation before you travel, but if you could back up your email to the cloud service, that's definitely the way to go. You can also eliminate traveling with as much privilege privileged information as possible, and also minimize the amount of confidential information. Now, some of our clients that are frequent business travelers, they have a burner phone for travel purposes, which is a phone that has no email. Um, it has the ability to call and text, and they use that when they're traveling internationally. If you are going to travel internationally and you have to carry work information with you, it's really important for you to know what's on your phone. I mean, think about it. Think of all the things that you carry on your phone. And I cross the border at least once a week, and I rarely think about what is in the phone that could cause problems at the border. But if you're traveling frequently for business, it's really important to know what's on your device. Um, it's always good to put your phone on airplane mode before you cross the border. And, you know, if you are going to try to assert a privilege, like attorney-client privilege, you should always be prepared to identify yourself as a business professional. So have your business card um, showing who you are and where you work. So why would you be searched? And we saw at the beginning of the webinar that you know the numbers are quite small in terms of the government asking to see your cell phone. It is extremely rare for the government without any provocation or suspicion to say to a Canadian or any international traveler the minute they see them hand me your phone. It is generally coupled with a reason for them to want to know more information about you. For example, you might not have the proper travel documents. You may not have a round trip ticket showing the government that you're coming and going from a source outside of the United States. You might not have the proper visa if that's required. You may have a criminal record or you may have had a brush with Customs and Border Protection when you were crossing the border with friends in the past. Oftentimes we have clients that unfortunately their names match a person's name in the government database. And then always know that the government can select you for a random search. But when we're thinking about crossing the border, we want to think about the total package of how you're presenting yourself to the government. So it's always important to know where you're going, where you're staying, who you're traveling with, and what you're bringing in. Don't make the fatal error of telling a story to the government that doesn't match your stuff. An example of that is we had a client many years ago who told the government they were traveling from Toronto to Las Vegas. They were going to gamble for a weekend with their friends. It was a girl's weekend. Government asked a few more questions weren't entirely convinced of the client's answers, and decided to take the inspection one step further, searched the client's phone, searched her laptop, searched her purse, and lo and behold discovered she was going to work at the Las Vegas office of her, her U.S. of her Canadian employers, and had all types of work information, 
uh, itineraries of meetings, emails, and the government said, are you kidding me? You told us you were going to gamble, and now you're coming to work. Well, guess what? That's fraud and misrepresentation. That can result in a lifetime ban from the United States. So you've got to be really careful when you're crossing the border. So key takeaways today. I know we're during lunchtime, and I always like to keep our webinars about 20 minutes or so so people can also enjoy a bite to eat during this time. So key takeaways today. The electronic searches have marginally increased under the Trump administration. There has been a small increase, but no, we're at the beginning of a new fiscal year for the government, and we haven't really seen how this new policy directive that was issued in January is going to shake out for fiscal year 2018. Keep in mind, privilege information can still be searched by the government. You should always approach your business travel strategically. Be aware of what's on your phone, what's in your luggage. I can't tell you the number of times I have stood at the Peace Bridge and the officer will ask, where are you staying in the United States? And the client doesn't know. I, I don't know, a hotel in New York. Well, you've got to know that. If you want to be successful in crossing the border, you tell them, I am staying at the Marriott Marquis in Times Square in New York. You need to be prepared when you cross the border. As you see, these folks are dealing with millions of people, you know, day in and day out, and it can only be to your benefit to be prepared when you're crossing that border. It's always good to budget extra time when you travel in the event of a search. I can tell you as a former immigration officer that spent five years at the border, the last thing you want to tell an officer is that you have to catch a flight, and officer, can you please hurry up? I can guarantee that will slow the process down for you. And then finally, if you're a business professional, be certain to always have your business card with you so the government knows who you are and who you work for. So today at Berardi Immigration Law, um, with this new directive, we're seeing a lot of opportunities to assist our clients. Uh, clients are coming to us and say, geez, we have a contingency of people coming to the United States um, for our you know, our annual meeting in Dallas, Texas. Can you help us figure out how we're going to get our folks across the border and how we're going to keep our really privileged information safe? We can provide you with strategies regarding how to keep that information safe, what to do if the government does search your personal or your work device. We're also creating policies for our corporate clients saying, listen, if you have a lot of international travel, your employees must know what to do and not to do at the border. So we're creating policies for those clients. We also have a robust blog where we're constantly providing up-to-minute information on border crossing policies and trends. Um, that stuff is coming out at lightning speed. The amount of immigration news right now is, is just unreal. And we're happy to speak with you or your company at any time on border crossing or immigration issues. So thank you for joining us today. If you have any questions, you have my contact information. I encourage you to call me or send me an email. Um, follow us on social media. We won't drive you crazy, but we will provide you with really important information for border crossing. We have an active blog. We have YouTube videos. We're on LinkedIn, Facebook, Twitter, all the usual suspects of social media. But this is not the time to guess um, about crossing the border. This is not the time to argue with the government with respect to unlocking the information on your iPhone. Um, so that's it for today. Rosanna Berardi, Berardi Immigration Law. We're happy to help you and any of your employees, friends, or family cross the border with confidence, and we're here to provide comprehensive business immigration solutions. Have a great day. Enjoy your lunch, and we'll see you next time.